Welcome everyone. Glad you're attending tonight. This will be a really exciting webinar, I think. Um, the Immigrant Rights Subcommittee of the Political Action Commission is presenting uh, this webinar. Um, and I'm Sarah, I'm with the Tucson Party and I'm a facil uh, facilitator with the Immigrant Rights Subcommittee on the uh, part of the Political Action Commission. And I will be the moderator for this evening's webinar. We're here tonight because I'm sure as many of us have observed, there is a campaign of anti-immigrant hate and racism by the extreme right that includes the Republican Party. Our panelists tonight will address the root causes of migration and the myths and lies being spread and what we can do to combat the lies being spread. We will have three panelists tonight and following that there will be a Q&A which will include a fourth panelist, fourth participant. The format will be 10 minute presentations and the second half hour will be discussion and we hope you'll enjoy us and you will join us in that discussion. And please put any questions you have in the Q and A because the chat will be disabled during the presentations. And we thank you for that. Um, and for those who would like to see uh, para la gente que quieren uh, preguntar una pregunta en español, por favor puede uh, someter su pregunta en el uh, Q&A y vamos a interpretar las preguntas en inglés. Okay, so um, I'm going to introduce our wonderful panelists now, and we will begin. Um, I will introduce all three here at the beginning of our webinar, and then we will begin with our first panelist, Alvaro. Uh, but first, I want to introduce Deb Wilmer. She's an immigration attorney living in Massachusetts. And after volunteering with repatriated migrants in Nogales, Mexico, Deb went to law school to better advocate for immigrant rights. And she will be speaking on existing avenues to legal status in the US and misconceptions about those. Daniel Delgado is a member of the LA Metro Club of the CPUSA and also a graduate student worker at the University of Southern California. And he'll be speaking about um, addressing the question that comes up, who is bringing in the drugs and the myths, myths that we hear about immigrants and crime. Alvo Avalo Rodriguez is our first panelist and he will introduce ourself, himself. So, we'll, so Alvaro, I'll we'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, if you'll bear with me, I'm going to share some slides with you. Let me uh, turn sharing on now and uh, see if we can do that. Oh, I hope you can see that first slide. Uh, says that it's we're gonna, this presentation is going to be about how to stop the immigrant hate campaign and address root causes of immigration. This again, this is a presentation of the Immigrant Rights Subcommittee of the CPUSA Political Action Commission, Comité de Derechos de los Inmigrantes, Comisión de Acción Política de CPUSA. I want to go ahead and do a trans, uh, trans, any introduction. Uh, I'm an immigrant from Mexico, so I know a little bit about uh, um, migration to this country. I grew up on the border of the Rio Grande, uh, and I grew up in Eagle Pass, Texas, which is a focus of recent media attention. You probably saw that on the media and the TV uh, recently. I worked alongside Im immigrants in Texas ranches. So uh, I'm very familiar with this issue. I've lived in Texas pretty much all my life. It, uh, so I'm very, very well aware of what's going on there with respect to uh, migration to this country. Here's some of the major, major points that i like to make that the anti-immigrant hate campaign is driven by a racist opportunist election campaign by extremists in the GOP that include Trump, Texas Governor Greg Abbott, U.S. Senator Ted Cruz and other extreme rightists in, this, in the United States. The hate campaign accuses undocumented workers in general of criminal activity. 
This claim is not supported by the facts, as you will find out from me and also from the uh, uh, next uh, next panelist. The hate campaign is primarily focused on immigrants of color. You notice they don't talk about immigrants coming out of Canada or immigrants coming out of Europe. So including those from Latin America and, and uh, Haiti, I should say the Caribbean in general. This hate campaign is not meant to discuss or solve the root causes of migration of labor migration, which is U.S. imposed economic inequality. And that's the root of the problem. So, uh, so what are the main drivers for uh, for uh, labor migration? Global economic inequality. Why is there economic inequality? Imperialism, U.S. imperialism, and its foreign policy maximizing profits from developing countries is what's driving this global economic inequality. So now we have an uh, uh, migrant labor coming to the United States from uh, also from 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 the Middle East. They're, they're coming from uh, from South America and, and other countries. Uh, this economic policy of maximizing uh, profits from developing countries is called neoliberalism. And it started back in the 1980s under uh, Reagan and Thatcher. Neoliberalism is the most brutal and violent form of international capitalism, imperialism. It violates the sovereignty of developing countries through predatory commercial agreements and other means. It is anti-union and favors outsourcing labor and other unfair labor practices. Drives wages down in developing countries, destroys the environment, and threatens and overthrows governments. Opposing, opposed to neoliberal policy, they benefit a tiny group of monopoly corporations in the United States. Here's an example of what I'm talking about when it comes to commercial predatory practices. We used to have a treat, uh, uh, a, a free trade agreement called NAFTA uh, between the United States, Mexico, and Canada. It was designed to drive Mexican small farmers off their communal lands. They call it hidos in Mexico. They were designed to deprive them of farm irrigation, watering, by damming up the rivers and other means. They were designed to dump surplus corn. Agri-corporations are subsidized by U.S. taxpayers to undermine small Mexican farmers. They were designed to eliminate communal land won by the Mexican Revolution in 1910 and designed to drive Mexican small farmers to the U.S. as cheap and insecure labor. So note the left government in Mexico replaced NAFTA with a more equitable agreement called the TEMEC, which means free trade agreement between Mexico, the U.S. and Canada. So that's what's in place right now. A NAFTA-style free trade agreement is still in effect in Central America. CAFTA, it's called CAFTA-DR. It is a NAFTA-style bad deal for Central America and the Dominican Republic. So what are some of the other causes uh, of migration to the United States? Wars and violence. Driven by the U.S. drug wars, regime changes in the region, and election interference in the region. Global warming caused by imperialism has also driven small farmers off their subsistence farms to seek work in the U.S. without visas. U.S. encourages migration of poor people from Venezuela, Cuba, Nicaragua in order to destroy their economies because these countries have decided to exercise their sovereign right to determine their own future. Only a small number of visas were extended recently. Many desperate people walked across dangerous areas to seek asylum in the United States. Most were some, uh, summarily expelled. So one of the charges that also the, our second panelist is going to respond to is this charge that undocumented immigrants are committing more crimes than U.S. born as alleged by Republicans and, and ICE. U.S. immigration and in, and and and. It's called uh, ICE, uh, Immigration and, and Customs Enforcement, reported recently to Republicans in Congress that more than 400,000 non-citizens committed crimes. These ICE figures are, are deliberately used to scapegoat undocumented workers of color as criminals. ICE does not indicate the time frame for these figures, yet attacks both non-citizens and, and, and sanctuary cities for political purposes. Report fails to mention that the term non-citizen include permanent residents, which are in the United States legally. 
In 2023, the FBI reported more than 14 million crimes committed in the United States, just in that single year, 14 million. Compare that to the 400,000 that are being reported by ICE. And many of those 400,000 uh, non-citizen committed crimes are actually committed by permanent residents that are legally here in this country. A comprehensive uh, university study of over 150 years showed that immigrants are significantly less likely to commit crimes than the U.S. born. So that's proven. So what can we do about this, right? We're talking about uh, all this uh, migration issues and the hate campaign against uh, immigrants of color. We can vote in November for political candidates that are pro-worker and for a comprehensive and humane immigration policy. Vote for those pr promoted and end to restrictive and repressive immigration policy. We want a comprehensive immigration reform with an expedited path to citizenship. We want to vote for political candidates to propose and act to correct the root causes of unregulated immigration. Vote for political candidates that, that act in support of U.S. commitments to climate actions and fulfillment of global climate agreements. As we said, glo global warming is one of the causes for uh, labor migration to the United States. Vote for candidates that, that favor respect for the sovereignty of other countries, especially developing countries. Vote for candidates that act to stop the export of U.S. manufactured weapons to other countries and take actions to reduce the high demand in the United States for harmful recreation drugs. That's, that, that is a big, big problem. Uh, there's, and, it, and our next panels will talk about that. So that is what I had to do, uh, what I have to present with respect to the fundamentals of migration uh, to this country. It, uh, we're not going to take up questions this time. We're going to wait until all the panelists have made their presentation before we take up questions. Thank you very much for paying attention to this. Thank you, Alvaro. Um, really appreciate that. Gracias, Alvaro. I'll just say uh, one more time that interpretation is available in Spanish, uh, Spanish English interpretation. Uh, está disponible interpretación en español. Escoja el globo que está abajo en la pantalla y escoja. Espanol or English. Um, okay, we will uh, move to our next panelist, and that will be Daniel Delgado. And uh, pass the mic to you. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, and uh, thank you, Alvaro, for um, a really good presentation that I think frames the conversation about uh, immigration myths and facts. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen so I can give my presentation. <clears throat> so um, I will also be following this kind of format of myths and facts and focusing on the issue of drugs and crime, um, particularly the myth about uh, immigrants bringing in illegal, illegal uh, fentanyl into the United States, which um, for anybody who watched the vice presidential debate, um, you know, that's one of the recurring sort of myths. And overall, throughout that entire vice presidential debate, um, immigrants were used in all these different ways to scapegoat, um, use them as scapegoats and not address um, the root causes. So I think this is a very timely conversation. And I hope that the presentation and, and these facts, um, you know, help us um, as we are in, uh, you know, as we canvas and talk to people um, in our neighborhoods or our coworkers, um, and we try to get out the vote and um, engage in electoral work, hopefully these facts will help us uh, in those conversations. So um, before getting into the actual um, like facts that I want to present, I want to frame a little bit more of this idea of dangerous speech, which I um, understand as language that inspires fear and violence by describing another group of people as an existential threat. Um, and in the context of immigrants, this uh, is used to um, basically construct immigrants as criminals. And one of the things that um, now, as a result of the right-wing politicians who spread these myths, 
um, believe is that uh, migrants are to blame for the fentanyl crisis. And according to analysis by the LA Times, social media posts blaming migrants for uh, fentanyl's toll more than tripled from December to January as we were heading into the election year. And, um, you know, lots of uh, right-wing media outlets such as Fox, ne Fox News um, present these myths and promote these myths in times of elections to uh, scare people and also to uh, avoid addressing uh, the real issues. So um, that's, you know, one of the sort of important things to consider about dangerous speech is the way that um, it's being used to promote violence and to uh, turn people away from real problems. And the the um, ultimate sort of effect is the material consequences that it has um, on people's lives. As for example, states, even states far away from the US-Mexico border, such as Florida, are calling in for National Guard troops to be sent to the border. Um, so this, you know, also goes in in uh, to the realm of you know the U.S. military industrial complex, and you know addressing the dangerous speech as it affects immigrants is also a way that we can uh, basically transition to a more peace based society. So the common myth that uh, fentanyl comes in through um, illegal, you know, unsupervised zones in the border by unauthorized migrants is, you know, very far from the truth. And the fact of the matter is that most of the fentanyl that is entering the country um, is not being smuggled by immigrants. In fact, they're not being smuggled through, um, you know, distant, uh, remote, unpoliced, zones of the US-Mexico border. In fact, they're coming in through official ports of entry, very tightly controlled um, ports of entry, but um, they get in nonetheless, uh, largely through commercial trucks and passenger cars and not in the backpacks of migrants crossing on foot and looking to present themselves to the border patrol uh, agents in order to apply for asylum. So um, these uh, ports of entry kind of look something like this. And it's largely through these uh, ports of entry that fentanyl is being brought in. And it's being brought in mostly by um, United States citizens uh, who are being pay paid by United States citizens to bring in fentanyl. And ultimately, uh, United States citizens are the ones who are consuming this fentanyl. So in other words, the immigrant, the myth about immigrants bringing in drugs, um, you know, is not only completely false, it distracts from the facts of the matter. And, and being able to address this problem is based on um, our ability to understand the facts. So, um, of course, this is connected more broadly to the idea that um, immigrants uh, commit more crimes and are more likely to commit more crimes. But of course, you know, even as the uh, data on fentanyl suggests, um, uh, this is true for other kinds of crimes too. Immigrants specifically commit less crime than native born citizens. Um, with that being said, uh, crime is at a 50 year low in the United States, according to um, the reporting from People's World that I read about this very issue. Um, and the important takeaway is that crime, you know, exists in a society that does not meet the most basic needs of its people. So um, the stories that I was listening to as I read about this issue about U.S. citizens um, who are themselves struggling with addiction and are in, in the United States also in um, situations of economic precarity or desperation, um, it's that, you know, the, the social needs in the United States are not being met. And that's what causes people in these circumstances to, some, to sometimes, you know, uh, participate in this kind of um, crime. So um, I think this really frames the issue and, and it really goes to show that the fentanyl crisis is something that needs to be addressed, not through uh, criminalizing migrants, but through treatment and prevention efforts here in the United States, and also um, promote addressing it as a public health issue that 
actually speaks to people's economic, social, cultural, educational well-being as a whole. Um, and, you know, basically this has very little to do with immigration at all. Um, <clears throat> so moving into the last bit of this presentation, I kind of wanted to talk about um, the relationship between the United States and, and Mexico and in particular, you know, frame this conversation as a broader topic in the war on uh, the war on drugs. <clears throat> so, Plan Merida, which was signed into law in two thousand eight, was signed between the U.S. government under Bush's administration and Mexican government under Felipe Calderón's administration. And for context, Felipe Calderón he belongs to a conservative right wing party in Mexico called Partido Acción Nacional that you know largely uh, represents the interests of you know businesses and also the you know catholic church um so um you know these these two conservative governments came together and they agreed on this plan as a way of ostensibly combating organized crime however since this initiative began the drug war in mexico has only exacerbated uh has resulted in a huge loss of life and the cartel are now even more heavily armed largely as a result of illegal weapons being smuggled in from the United States to uh, Mexico. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, between 2016 and 20, 2022, around 70 to 90 percent of traced firearms um, in Mexico originated from and passed through the United States. And of course, this is you know linked to the fact that in the United States, there uh, isn't a lot of tight gun control regulations. So it's very easy for um, U.S. citizens who are the ones who are largely trafficking these weapons to Mexican drug cartels to buy weapons here and then uh, connect them to the Mexican drug cartels. Um, it says here that um, based on some uh, journalism in the Washington Post that money and guns from the United States drive the deadly violence and drug trafficking in Mexico. The money the cartels use to pay for the guns comes from largely from their sale of illegal drugs to buyers in the United States. Um, so, uh, you know, this myth of somehow there being this existential threat coming from Mexico to the United States that justifies then, um, you know, sending in more border patrol to the U.S.-Mexico border. In reality, it's the threat is that in the United States and its lack of regulation on guns um, is basically arming these Mexican drug cartels that then spread regional violence and is one of the factors driving forced migration, as uh, Alvaro was pointing out. So, uh, of course, in the media, when this is presented, it's usually not addressed as a problem about gun control in the United States or about needing to address, you know, uh, people's addiction to crime, I mean, addiction to uh, fentanyl in a, a humane sort of like public health centered way. Instead, they focus on the Mexican drug cartels as a way to then justify even greater military violence against Mexico. Uh, Republican politicians like Lindsey Graham and, and Ron DeSantis um, have suggested that we bomb parts of Mexico or send in a detachment of the US military to deal with the fentanyl crisis. And so of course, you know, going to war with Mexico is not the answer to the fentanyl crisis and you know, is based on all these myths that construct immigrants from Mexico as criminals and as threats and fail to ad address the the root causes. So um, yeah, with that, I'll, I'll end my presentation and I look forward to the Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Daniel. Uh, gracias, Daniel. Okay, um, and I just wanna uh, say a quick thank you to our interpreters for tonight. Um, we have David and Mari who are interpreting. Gracias a David y Mari. Que, uh, Están interpretando. Again, I'll just repeat that we have interpretation available uh, by choosing the globe below. Uh, pueden escoger el globo abajo que dice interpretación y escoger español o inglés. Okay, we'll move on to our third panelist, and that will be Deb. And I will turn the mic over to you, Deb. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. And uh, thank you to our two panelists before me for great presentations. I will share my screen here with you. I hope you can all see it. 
Okay, there we go. Okay, so I am going to give you um, a little bit of an overview of immigration law because there are a lot of lies and, and misconceptions about the law. Of course, being a lawyer, first I want to do a legal disclaimer. Nothing in this presentation should be construed as legal advice. You should always consult a competent lawyer for evaluation of your personal situation because uh, employment, or sorry, immigration law is a very complicated area of law. One uh, myth you hear from people a lot is, oh, why don't they get in line and wait their turn? Well, not anyone can come to the US. You can't just come to the US and get a green card because you feel like it. There are a very few limited ways to come to the US and get a green card. Some of them have extremely long waiting periods. Some of them are very difficult to get. There are three broad categories, employment, family, humanitarian. And if you don't fall into one of those, then you're not coming to the US at least not to get a green card. Uh, for employment visas, I'm not real familiar with those, but I know that there are several, both immigrant and non-immigrant. Immigrant means you have a pathway to a green card, which can then lead to citizenship. Non-immigrant is uh, just a temporary visa. Uh, most of those, as far as I know, require the Department of Labor to certify that, uh, certify that there are not sufficient U.S. workers able, willing, qualified, and available to accept the job opportunity in the area, and that the employment of this foreign worker will not adversely affect the wages and working conditions of similarly employed U.S. workers. Um, as you can imagine, this is not easy to establish. So first, your employer needs to establish that before they can hire you as a foreign worker. And there are five permanent immigrant worker categories that I'm aware of. They are predominantly available to people with special skills, um, a high degree of education. Um, they're specifically not available to farm workers or uh, seasonal workers. Um, there are a few available for what they call unskilled labor, which just means that the job requires less than two years of college. And there's very few of those available. So there is actually a long wait in line for that. And you're probably, depending on the type of visa, you probably need your employer to sponsor you. So you're very dependent on the employer. Uh, family is another way to get to the US. However, marrying an American isn't quite the dream everybody says it is. You, um, can marry an American, a U.S. citizen, or a green card holder, and, but there are certain criminal convictions that would bar a citizen or green card holder from sponsoring you. Um, you also, certain convictions that on your part as the intending immigrant could also uh, bar you from getting a green card. Additionally, uh, green card holder spouses have to wait until a visa is available. Uh, could be like three, four years, it's hard to say. And if your spouse that you're sponsoring is currently in the US, but they came to the US unlawfully, they didn't go through a port of entry, they came in between ports of entry through the desert or the river, then in order for your spouse to get that green card, they have to go back to the home country and go through the US embassy there, which is a big enough problem. But the real problem is, Depending on the situation, as soon as they leave this country, they kick in a 10-year bar. So they can't come back, green card or no, spouse or no, they can't come back for another 10 years. Obviously, this is really a problem. And a lot of families, uh, one spouse chooses to remain undocumented because um, that's just the only thing that's uh, practical and possible for them. Now, um, I will say that Biden did try to put in a plan quite recently that would work around that for them, give them parole in place, and so they don't have to leave the country. And of course, the Republican state uh, attorney generals uh, took it to court and then put a stop on it immediately. Oh, and we've all heard the um, pejorative term anchor babies. 
um, there's this myth that somehow coming here and having a child who is then a U.S. citizen is going to help you as the parent. And it's really not. Um, once your citizen child is 21, if they have enough money to sponsor you, they can sponsor you. But 21 years is a very long time. You'll have the same problem if you had come through the uh, into the country illegally. You'll have to go back to your home country again, kicking in a 10-year bar. Doesn't matter that you have a citizen child. And 21 years is a really long time. You could be deported. Your family could be torn apart. Um, you know, perhaps you have multiple entries that can create all sorts of problems too. Um, and so for a lucky few, they have found a waiting line, which can be very long. If you're trying to sponsor your brother or sister, it's about 15 to 20 years. Okay, humanitarian would be the third uh, broad category. I won't try to explain all of them, but we have asylum, SIJ for juveniles. VAWA for uh, battered spouses, U visas for crime victims, T visas for trafficking victims, temporary protected status, and some parole for Afghan and Iraqi people who have helped the US in, um, in the Middle East. Now, uh, not all of these lead to a green card. For instance, temporary protected status does not. Um, and they also, from what I understand, most PPS, uh, only lasts maybe 18 months. And they always wait till the last minute to let you know if they're going to renew it or not. So people have to live, you know, on pins and needles, wondering what's going to happen, um, constantly in limbo. Now, asylum, your persecution is for people who are persecuted. But, and I don't think everyone understands this, you have to be persecuted for one of five protected grounds and eco economic problems in your home country, climate problems, those aren't protected grounds. You need to be persecuted either because of your race, religion, nationality, political opinion, or membership in a particular social group. Particular social group is something like um, LGBTQ, is considered a particular social group that um, is often persecuted. Um, particular social group is the one category where there is some room for legal argument. For instance, one particular social group that has been recognized is married women in Guatemala who are unable to lease a relationship. And if your persecution is not on one of the, those five grounds, then there's no asylum for you. You'll, you could potentially be um, sent back to your home country with your life totally at risk, but not for one of those five reasons, you get sent back anyways. And surprisingly, that is actually in line with the international treaties to limit it to those five grounds. Okay, so Biden has tried to do some parole measures. They've been temporary and had lots of problems, but like I said, some of them were really, you know, good. I mean, it was something and of course, all of them have been, you know, the try the Republican states try to stop them, like the role in place I just told you about. He is the CHNB is Cuba, Haiti, Nicaragua, Venezuela parole. I just read recently that he's ending that um, instead of renewing it. Like I say I, I don't really know why, but I know a lot of people's lives are going to be thrown into turmoil. Um, he has really attacked asylum. And he has a law now or an order now that basically if you come to the U.S. border between regular ports of entry and try to enter, they won't let you apply for asylum. This is 100% illegal, both internationally, treaties, U.S. law, it's 100% illegal and it's absolutely horrible. And it's creating a real difficulty for people because unlike Title 42, Title 42, when they took, uh, sent them out of the country, there were no negative long-term consequences. These attacks on asylum, if you come in and you try to get asylum between ports of entry and you get deported, there's, I think, a five-year bar. So there's a definitely a negative, con uh, negative problem with that. 
Okay. And unsurprisingly, Trump manages it to be frighteningly worse. He has promised attacks on immigrants with lawful status, and including um, the Haitian immigrants that he likes to uh, degrade so much. Um, most of them have TPS, um, but I'm sure he'll do away with TPS if he gets the chance. And he has promised mass deportations and called it, said that it would be a bloody story. He is planning on, should he win, deporting 11 million undocumented people. And it, obviously that's not practically possible, but he can't do that. But what they can do is they can send Border Patrol, ICE, National Guard, police into commu immigrant communities in black and brown neighborhoods and terrorize people even more than they already are. They're going to build camps in Texas if they get the chance. If they would build camps into the Texas desert to uh, house people until they can be deported. And I imagine they will have to do this so fast that there will be no uh, attention paid to safety or sanitary sanitation norms. Uh, we already see serious human rights violations in our existing detention centers. And uh, basically he is also trying to overturn a law that limits the amount of time children can be hold in a detention center. So essentially he's also calling them detention camps, but the word camp, there's a obvious connection there to concentration camps and that is not lost on his base. And finally, uh, just a reminder to everyone to please vote. Thank you so much, Deb, for your presentation. Thank you to all of the presenters, on all of the panelists. So we will mo be moving into our Q&A next. Uh, and, uh, but first I wanna introduce our fourth panelist for the Q&A. And so we wanna welcome Emil Skeppers, who will join for our Q&A panel. Emil was born in Johannesburg, South Africa and moved to the United States with his family as a child. He got a BA in anthropology from American University and an MA and PhD from Northwestern University in anthropology in 1974. He's done research in inner city communities in Chicago and been active in labor solidarity immigrant rights, and anti-imperialist work for many years. He's been a frequent contributor of articles to the People's World, and from 2009 to 2019 was the International Secretary of the CPUSA. He currently resides in Richmond, Virginia. Thank you, Emil, for joining our panelists. Well, thank you for inviting me. So we'll start with the questions. Um, the first question that I have on my uh, Q&A screen is, um, what would you say to someone who asks why more immigrants don't come into the country legally? And I think that Deb addressed this pretty thoroughly, but I don't know if there's anything else you wanna add to, to this, Deb. Sure. Um, one of the other problems that I hadn't mentioned is that they only let you go through the legal ports of entry well, first, you have to make an appointment on the CBP-1 app on your phone. If it actually works for you and you're lucky, you your appointment's going to be four months out at least. And so you have to stay in Mexico in a border town where it's not safe for you. It's not, um, you know, they aren't they don't have sanitary camps there um, and people run out of their money. And so sometimes people, you know, because that's such a horrible situation, people will try to uh, cross unlawfully to get out of that situation. Thank you. Okay, Our, the next question, uh, I wonder if a lot of fentanyl is made in the US anyway, therefore it is not even being brought in. So maybe I'll, I'll, put, I'll uh, throw this question to Daniel. That is an interesting um, hypothesis and I don't have the, data to know that right now but i but connecting it back to the us I, one thing i do know is that one of the ways in which people even get hooked onto fentanyl is actually through you know legally prescribed opiates opiates 
um, that, you know, big pharma is basically responsible for producing. Um, and usually, you know, people like get the stories I've heard, right? People get in a car accident or something and they get prescribed some kind of like really intense painkiller and then they get hooked onto that and and then they kind of like go on from there and, you know, uh, can um, people can fall into some sort of addiction. So definitely, I think that there's something about the United States culture around drug consumption that should definitely be addressed and it has to do with um, the big corporate interests behind how we relate to medicine and how we relate to um, health in general. So that's, you know, one thing that I think about, um, you know, when asked that question, I don't know exactly um, the, the, you know, data on like production of fentanyl, but definitely um, it's, it's uh, completely, you know, uh, it's, it's not factual to uh, think of it as an external problem. I think it's something that is definitely uh, a domestic concern that we need to be addressing uh, through treatment and through other kinds of uh, public health initiatives. Thank you, Daniel, thank you. Okay, our next question is, Alaska has the highest crime rates vastly committed by white Americans. I think that that is a comment. I don't know if, if that was meant to have a question attached to it, um, but maybe you could add in the Q and A if there's a question attached. Uh, and then, so we'll move on to the next question, which is, Given that U.S. foreign policy under both parties in the form of regime change operations, crippling economic sanctions and exercises of power like assassinations and establishing military bases is at the heart of destabilizing underdeveloped exploited countries. One need only look at Cuba, Venezuela, Brazil, Haiti, Philippines, etc. Why is there so little criticism for the complicity of the DNC in creating and exacerbating the immigration crisis? through imperialist interventions. Yes, the RNC runs the most openly xenophobic rhetoric against immigrants and are rightfully critiqued for such, but the DNC keeps prom promising harsher and harsher border control and migration laws and keeps funding the police more and more. Why so little accountability for the DNC? Um, I would like to pass this question to Alvaro and Emil about that. Uh, let, let, let me let me give that a try. Uh, the thing about it is that we have you you're absolutely right about about both parties involved in imperialist policy. And uh, the the thing about it is that we have to develop a strategy as to how we're going to get from here to there. And we need to gain more ground, and we we need to go ahead and win some efforts. So is Ted Cruz the same as his opponent in Texas? And the answer is no, they're not. They're not the same. And uh, so we have to struggle to ensure that we have the best chance to create a, a different policy in this country. Those are the options that we have at the moment. And uh, so it's not a matter of whether letting one party off the hook versus another party, but rather that we have to find a way to gain the ground that we need to win further battles in the future. So this is a long, wrong game, not a short game. Uh, I'll let, uh, I think I'll let Emil try to answer that if he can. Yeah, uh, quite correct. Uh, the person who asked the question. They're both uh, capitalist parties. They both uh, do not oppose imperialism. Uh, but uh, the uh, Trump group and the events also are really on a fast attack. And it's extremely dangerous. I'm sort of surprised there haven't been more bloody in, in, in incidents, you know, gunshots fired against Haitian refugees and things like that. Vance just came up with another one. Uh, there is a housing crisis in this country. Very hard for people to get of modest income to get uh, rental housing. There are complicated capitalist reasons for this action to finance capital, private equity funds, 
hedge funds and so forth, which are speculating in real estate and also other, other political influences. So Vance says, well, the reason that's, that housing is scarce and that the price of housing has gone up because there are too many immigrants coming into the country. So, you know, and he puts this on top of his, the statements about the Haitian people in Springfield, Ohio, eating the puppy dogs and kitty cats. Uh, you know, I mean, there's no lie too big for this particular faction of the capitalist world. Labor is an important thing here. Labor came in the 1990s after many unions having an anti-immigrant stance. Organized labor came wholesale in favor of the rights of the immigrants. And uh, the uh, Republicans are extremely anti-labor. So no, when whatever happens, if Harris wins, we still have to organize, we still have to pressure. We had to do that with Obama too. It didn't just happen without pressure from the base. Uh, the positive things. There were some th positive things. The DACA thing, for instance, and and prosecutorial discretion. So you're right, but you know we look at the ground that we have to fight on in the in the future, and the ground that that Trump and Vance would create is very dangerous for all concerned. Thank you, Emil. Okay, uh, the, the next question is, can someone speak on the status of DACA? I think, Deb, I'll turn this over, question to you. Sure, um, DACA is still in the courts. From what I've read, it's in the Fifth Circuit of, Circuit Court of Appeals is hearing arguments very soon on the 10th. And at the moment, you cannot apply for DACA new, but if you had it already, you can renew it and you can renew your employment card too. Great, thank you. And the next question is also for you, Deb. If possible, can you talk about the volatility of immigration laws with the different administrations and how it impacts immigration outside the US? Um, immigration laws and policies and procedures, they do make huge differences when there's a change in administration, everything changes. Um, it's very confusing for not only for the lawyers, but of course, it's going to be even more confusing for the immigrants. Um, and I'm not sure when you say immigration outside the U.S., if you mean like how it impacts people outside coming in. Um, I know that, you know, people hear things and, you know, so my guess is that if, um, you know, if Trump were elected, probably that there'd be a fall in immigration would be my guess. Um, I'm not really sure. Thank you. Thank you, Deb. So the next question is, uh, ¿Cuál sería la posibilidad de arreglar papeles para familias indocumentadas que nunca tuvieron una visa de turista? Pero tienen un hijo o hija que va a cumplir 21 años. So what would be the possibility to uh, adjust your papers uh, for family, for undocumented families that never had uh, a tourist visa, but they have a child, a, a son or daughter who is going to become 21 years of age? And again, I'll, I'll give Deb that question, please. Well, like I said before, this is not legal advice. Um, I would say, you know, of course, uh, the 21 year old, they need to meet certain income requirements, but they can of course sponsor their parent. Um, by saying the parent didn't have a tourist visa, I assume you're saying the parent did not enter the country lawfully. And if that is the case that the parent didn't enter the country lawfully, can still become a citizen, or I'm sorry, you can still get your green card. It's just that the trouble is you have to go back to your home country doing which you might end up uh, kicking in these tenure bars. Thank you, Deb. The next question, will the screenshot presented be available after this class? Um, this uh, whole session, this whole webinar will be available. It's being recorded. Um, I think that's what you mean. And, and are you wondering about the slides? I think the slides will also be a part of that uh, recording. So I think the answer to that is yes. And the next question is, what are economic advantages to the detention system, to the prison system, 
and the names of the companies profiting. Let's see. Um, Alvaro, do you want to take this one or, or perhaps Emil? I, all I can say, Sarah, in general, is that a lot of the prisons in the United States are being privatized, so they are they are profit centers. So it would benefit them. In fact, I remember when they were uh, incarcerating entire families. They were coming here, and they 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 had to put them up in different places. They were all private prisons here in Texas, so they, they are making a lot of money from that. Uh, now it's costing the taxpayer a lot of money to do this, and uh, so it's it's a bad policy. What what's happening? the The United States cannot grow without immigrant labor, migrant labor from other countries, because we don't have the birth rates that we need. Uh, to the, the only way to grow the economy is you have to have more more workers, or you have to have more productivity that is more capital invested in in the in the automation systems and uh, neither one is is uh well uh capital investments uh require you know spending more money so it's less profit involved there so the preference is to have undocumented immigrants coming to this country to willing to work for low wages and harsh working conditions and that's what the the whole aim of their policy is it uh so i i i think there's certainly a lot of the main motivation for the migrant labor is to gain uh, migrants to this country that that are live under precarious conditions and are willing to accept low wages and and bad working conditions and uh, so that's that's the aim of of u.s imperialist policy maybe emil has some other things to say about that yeah. or daniel perhaps or daniel, daniel. Mm -hmm. also wants to respond i don't know oh uh, yeah well i was just going to point out to um like the yeah like the prison industrial complex the military industrial complex the weapons man manufacturing corporations like all of the you know corporate power invested in um, the profits that can be gained, right? By either just having low gun control so that, you know, what all sorts of weapons can be produced in the US um, and then, you know, given to police departments and border patrol agents and um, corrections officers in prisons, right? Like these are entire um, complexes that affect like all sorts of aspects of life and are interconnected. And, um, you know, these are the people who benefit from scapegoating immigrants because they're profiting off of a system that, uh, you know, needs to ignore the root causes, needs to ignore uh, addressing uh, addiction as a, as a public health issue, um, needs to ignore, you know, the fact that um, it's U U.S. weapons that are making the cartels more violent and ignore, you know, the fact that... Um, destabilizing other countries with economic sanctions and 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 uh military interventions uh create forced displacement right um so yeah I, I would point out those kind of like major corporate interests as like the people who profit from scapegoating immigrants who are interested in scapegoating immigrants as well as the you know people who benefit from their labor thank you the next question, can you speculate on the effect the new presidency in Mexico will have? Emil, perhaps you could comment on that. Or if anyone else has, has some, uh, some comments on that to share. Yeah, this Alvaro. Um, yeah, I think that the new, the new presidency in Mexico, Mexico, for instance, for, I think we should recognize as the first female president in North America. So this is a great thing. It's a great day for Mexico. Claudia Scheinbaum is, uh, took office on October 1st, and she intends to continue with the policy of Mexico, uh, of the fourth transformation of Mexico, which is to have a policy of protecting the sovereignty of Mexico from U.S. intervention in Mexico. The U.S., through the Drug Enforcement Agency, has tried uh, 
to smear both Dr. Claudia Scheinbaum and also the former president of Mexico, AMLO, is being drug, you know, basically they're, you know, they're, they're, they're drug traffickers. It was all, you know, that, that, that's how they were trying to smear them. This did not, was not believable to the Mexican people who voted uh, for 36 million Mexican people voted for uh, Claudia Scheinbaum. So it, it didn't carry, it is not winning. Uh, there's also like, like Daniel said, there, there's, there is a demand by some uh, Republicans to invade Mexico under the pretext that they want to fight the narco terrorist uh, cartels in Mexico. And Mexico has, and that includes the new president of Mexico has, has said that she would not accept that at all. They're, they don't need U.S. help. Uh, that this will only aggravate the problem. This has been tried before using repression, using uh, force against uh, the cartels and people that are selling drugs from Mexico is resulting in the death of 100,000 people in Mexico under the presidency of Calderon. And uh, they don't want a repeat of that. It does not work. The only way you can reduce the trafficking of drugs is to end the consumption, of, the large consumption of drugs in the United States, which is the largest consumer of drugs in the world. And uh, so I think the president of Mexico understands that, that you have to deal with the root cause, which is addressing the the, the huge consumption of drugs in the United States. And, uh, and they're willing to help in any way they can. They also have launched a campaign in Mexico also to ensure that that young people and others do not get uh, into the drug uh, in drug consumption problems. Uh, but I think Daniel mentioned uh, that in, in, in the addiction in the United States started with uh, the excessive use of oxycodone and others that were prescribed uh, legally. Uh, those legal drugs were hooked up a lot of people on on uh, on opioids, and and that has that was a direct path to the use of fentanyl, which has caused tremendous amounts of overdoses in this country. But it, they're trying to put the blame on immigrants on that. It's not the root causes are different. It's a health crisis that we have on our hands in the United States. Thank you, Alvaro. Um, so I'm going to combine a couple of the upcoming questions. Uh, so in urban areas like New York City, elected officials have started to scapegoat immigrants for their shortcomings. In addition to voting, how do we fight this anti-immigrant rhetoric and violence? Um, and that ties into one of the other questions that says, I've met many working class people in New York City who have negative views of migrants because of the racist propaganda and scapegoating, including people who are immigrants themselves. What is the best way to talk with people who hold these views? Who would like to take this question uh, from our panelists? What is the best way to talk with people who hold these views and how do we fight this rhetoric besides uh. voting? Yes. Sarah? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, this is what we're doing right here in this webinar. I mean, this is one webinar and it's reaching some people and the recorded version will re reach uh, more. Uh, the party has a pamphlet which covers these points, which is available to the public. Uh, and I think, I don't know if we have a way of putting the, the, uh, the URL for that pamphlet. But we have basically have to get into where the working class people and the mass and other, you know, popular sectors are organizing and struggling, combine with those efforts and bring that information, the information you heard here tonight, to them. Because the average person doesn't know this. The average US born person, unless they have immigrant relatives doesn't know what a hell of a struggle it is just to get legal legal uh you know uh, a legal visa for a permanent residency here and then citizenship after that if the, you hear over and over again well but why don't they just come legally well as we have explained they can't and then another person had asked about sanctions that have been put on these countries 
plus Alvaro was explaining all the imperialistic impacts of the U.S. economic policy and the the activities of U.S. agribusiness. And, you know, people are being forced to come here. And if you don't want them to come here, then you have to change the foreign policy. You have to curb the activities of the multinational corporations, agribusiness and others. And, uh, you know, even with the Democrats, and up, it's an uphill struggle. But there are some Democrats, uh, mostly in the progressive Democratic group, who are listening to this and will help to promote that. But labor will help to promote it. Some of the churches will help to promote it. And, uh, you know, so it's a long struggle, but we have to, we have to do it. Thank you. Okay, um, Rosanna, how many how many more questions can we take? Um, I think we can go for another fifteen minutes or so. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, so um, the next question that I'm seeing, uh, uh, the questioner is asking about the Catholic Church. Catholic Church plays a terrible role in Nicaragua. U.S. legislatures, for example, Tim Kaine, really are influenced by the Catholic Church. Does anyone have talking points we can use when talking to legislators like Tim Kaine? <laughs> Emil, would you have, do you have any uh, uh, response to that? Uh, let somebody else take that one. Okay. Give it a try. This is Alvaro. Uh, just just a, a, a statement in terms of uh, Mexico, for instance, is, is primarily a Catholic country. Most people in Mexico are Catholics. And the way that the left coalition in Mexico has been able to win is by saying that the politics of a coalition politics in Mexico, the electoral politics has to have a particular uh, preference for the poor. Just as it's the you know, Catholic Church has made it uh, its objective, or says so in writing, and, and that that policy is and demonstrated actually that is good policy to have a preference for the poor. Most immigrants come to this country because of inequality, poverty, it uh, uh, or, or or crisis created by poverty. In uh, so uh, what what Mexico is proposing. And I think the Catholic Church uh, doctrine would 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 follow that is by having a preference for the poor and ensuring that people have an opportunity to stay in their own country and and gain a, a, a make a living for their families is the best policy to address the root causes. And and Mexico has established a jobs program, cre uh, growing trees and, and and productive you know and crops and so forth, and and, and making small producers uh, stay in their country. Uh, they also have established such a program in Latin America, and they have asked the United States government to help with funding for some of these programs, and there has been a refusal to do so because they prefer to use the old Cold War policies of let's squeeze the, uh, the, the, the socialist-oriented developing countries so that the, it will be an example for the rest of the countries not to go that route. And uh, But I think that this policy of a preference for the poor is a good policy that goes right in there with the Catholic doctrine, at least in, in the Bible. So uh, I think that that would be a way to respond to them, that there's nothing wrong with having a preference for the poor and ensuring that, that, that we treat people with dignity. Immigrants should be treated with dignity and with understanding that the only way to stop the migration of labor is to have equality and, and 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 have a way for people to make a living in their own countries, which they would prefer rather than to risk death and, and all this all this stuff that's going on here in this country. They stay in their own countries if they if they had a better you know way to make a living there. Thank you. Um so let's take this next question. Can you enlarge on the terror facing immigrant and refugee communities under the threats from Trump of immediate mass deportation? 
no, one of the other questions related to this is our party speaks, rightly speaks, on the threat of concentration camps under a second Trump term. During the Trump administration, sections of the left, including Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, referred to the detention centers as concentration camps. Do we consider these still existing detention centers to be concentration camps or rather as institutions that have the potential to become concentration camps? But I want to remark, uh, comment on either of those um, questions. The terror facing immigrant and refugee communities under the threats from Trump. I'm probably not the best person for that one. Maybe uh, if one of the other panelists has uh, volunteered a lot with the um, immigrant community, they may be able to talk to that. When it comes to the um, currently existing um, uh, detention centers, which are prisons, um, I don't know if they're concentration camps or not. I would have to do um, some research to find out just how bad they currently are. Um, I would uh, venture a guess that probably all of our prisons um, for you know native born and and uh, uh, foreign born are probably all pretty close. Great, thank you, Sarah. If I might just say something uh, about the the terror associated with this kind of policy in Texas, uh, Governor Greg Abbott is one of the biggest advocates. Being a Christian fundamentalist, he's one of the biggest advocates of attacks on immigrants. And uh, he has in, helped introduce this SB4, which is a law that is now in the courts that would allow all law enforcement agencies to question people about their immigration status. And uh, that, would be, uh, that would be terrible because it would be a form of racial profiling uh, and, and, and so it goes way beyond the immigrant community, it goes to all immigrants that are in this country that could face such a uh, confrontation with law enforcement just because of their uh, color of their skin uh, and other characteristics. So uh, I think that this, this is something that would affect people way beyond just the, the, the uh, undocumented workers they're coming to this country uh so it's it's terrible you know it would be terrible uh and we should see parallels between what's happening there and what happened in nazi germany yeah thank you hey um so a couple more questions i think we have time for a couple more um so whose interests are served by the scapegoating of immigrants and why is this happening right now? What are some of the ways that it has happened in the past? Sarah? Emil. Well, I hate to sound like a broken record, but the interests of dividing the working class, scapegoating people, et cetera, always serve the, the, the interests of the big capitalists and finance capital. And the thing I mentioned before about housing, when Vance blames the immigrants for driving up the cost of housing, he's giving cover to those capitalist sectors who are in fact manipulating the prices of housing, the supply of housing, and driving uh, the prices up so that working class people in many cases cannot afford even a cheap rental apartment anymore because it's not cheap. I just moved to Richmond, Virginia from Annandale and I had to do that because a private equity company bought up my whole entire rental housing development there and many more in the Washington DC metro area. And they, neglected maintenance and they jacked up the rents so I and others had to leave and they're going to be replaced by upscale people you know with uh, much higher incomes to say now this is the immigrants who are pushing people out of the housing market is typical but it's a dirty game and it has to be exposed in every way we can. And you can do that by going to public hearings, for instance, on issues like housing, 
in pointing this out. We do have a brochure. The, our party also has a brochure on housing, which explains the reasons why we have a housing crisis. And, uh, you know, if you contact us, we can point you to it. Thank you, Emil. So I think um, we, well, let's take uh, another question and see if we have time for two. But how are all working class people, regardless of immigration status, affected by the scapegoating of immigrants? Really good question. Um, Daniel, would you like to take that one? Well, I think it's a, it's a good uh, follow up to the previous question about who benefits from scapegoating immigrants. If it's, you know, the big agro monopolies, like the five major agricultural monopolies in the U.S. that, um, you know, rely on cheap, vulnerable immigrant labor, um, at, or it's the weapons manufacturer who benefit from, you know, contracts with the Border Patrol and the DEA to keep fighting uh um, a senseless war on drugs, um, you know, or it's also the uh, oil industries that, um, you know, for example, Vance was talking about how uh, the immigrants were coming in and um, this was, uh, you know, causing people to lose their jobs. And also they were like going to be um, taking com uh, corporations elsewhere, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, I'd say it, it, time and time again, like the people who are benefiting from scapegoating immigrants are the same people who are responsible for the, um, you know, poor quality of life for working class everyday people. They're responsible for inflation and, um, you know, spending money on wars instead of ending poverty, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the way that I would approach the issue. Okay, thank you. Deb, yeah. Yes. Um, I just wanted to bring attention to a uh, question or a comment from Cesar Ruiz de Castillo, Castilla, and he's very correct in saying that just want it to be noted that 21-year-olds who do not have the financial means to sponsor their parents have the opportunity to get a co-sponsor who does meet the financial requirements. Although it is no easy feat to find an individual that can be trusted with that responsibility. And yes, co-sponsors are definitely possible. Um, they have to be willing to sign what is a contract with the government. Um, but if you can find someone, then uh, then you can uh, get around it that way. Great. Sarah? Yes, Alvaro. Yeah, uh, I just want to say something about that question, last question about uh, who gains from uh, from dealing with this uh, with this scapegoating, uh, the entire working class wins. Uh, I, I remember where uh, organized labor in this country, unions in this country were uh, were not very favorable to immigrants because they saw them as competitors. Now the growest, largest growing sector of the union movement is among immigrant workers in the public sector, in the service sector. So. They see that is 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 a huge uh, uh, mobilization for unionization, in and that will affect you know the the correlation of forces in this country in favor of the working class. The other thing that's happening is that many many of these uh, uh, immigrants, uh, if once they get a comprehensive immigration reform in place and they become uh, citizens they tend to vote in favor of progressive change. And that is not in the interest of the capitalist class. So it will change the correlation of forces there as well. So it's in everybody's interest to protect immigrant rights. Thank you. Thank you. I think we're about at time. Um, Rosanna, can we take another question or two? Um, but I think we're probably about ready to uh, close it off. Um, Let's let's go to each of the panelists now and see if you have a last word you'd like to offer um, regarding um, anything that we've had, uh, anything you've presented or also any of the questions um, 
that you'd like to maybe follow up and say another word or two about. Thank you. How about we go with um, uh, with Daniel first? Thank you. Oh, I would, uh, I guess my final comment would be, you know, <clears throat> to resist crime being the way to frame, uh, you know, discussions on immigration, hmm. you know, in, in our conversations when we're like canvassing, getting out the vote, uh, talking to our coworkers about political action, et cetera, et cetera, um, you know, resist um, conceding that uh, immigration and crime, that there's a relationship between the two and try to, you know, flip the conversation to address, you know, who are the real people who are really committing crimes against humanity, um, against the environment, against working class people. It's these big corporations, the same ones that are trying to scapegoat immigrants. And it's, you know, these far right corrupt politicians who um, are scapegoating immigrants. These are the same enemies of, you know, working class people all across the world. So that's kind of like how I want to end is like, uh, in a sort of way that focuses on when we're having conversations um, in our electoral work leading up to this November election, you know, how to frame conversations so that we can get productive outcomes out of out of our conversations with people. Yeah. Okay, uh, Emil, um, I'm going to pass it to you next. Uh, there, there's also a question that I just wanted to um, ask you to say a word or two about. Um, that she's asked, or they have asked, immigration is a global issue. What lessons can we learn from how others are tackling this issue? For example, South Africa and Europe. Okay, there are two things I, I wanted to quickly address. In South Africa, we got the same problem. What's happening is that the country, South Africa has a lot of economic problems right now, but the other countries next to it especially Mozambique and Zimbabwe are in worse shape. So you're getting a lot of immigrants going into South Africa. And we have a phenomenon of some of the opportunistic elements in South African politics, uh, including the former Zulu king, uh, pushing very heavily chauvinistic and, you know, how, this is uh, racist in its roots, but they're saying this black South Africans have suffered so much over the years under apartheid. Now we have these opportunistic poor people coming in from Zimbabwe and Mozambique, and they should be thrown out. And there have even been threats of, of violence against them, people coming down from as far north as Somalia. So, and in Europe, the same, you know, a right wing anti immigrant guy that just got elected in, party just got elected in Austria in the elections that just happened there. Riots in England, uh, you know, fortunately, big counter demonstrations to big nasty stuff in France, in Italy, and everywhere you go. This is a, an international problem, but it's following the same dynamics. I did want to mention one other thing. One of the questions in the question and answer was about the sanctions. We're seeing large numbers of Cubans, Venezuelans, and Nicaraguans coming into the United States now too. And part of that is ferocious sanctions that the United States, especially under Trump, but not only Trump, have put in on all the left-wing led countries. I was in Cuba in April, 2017, and things were fine. Very improved state, you know, level of living. New cars on the streets, along with the old ones that Cuba is famous for. Now it's a mess. And you've got large numbers of Cubans leaving Cuba, wanting to come here. And one of the things our party is working on is a campaign to stop those sanctions and especially to take Cuba off the list of state sponsors of terrorism, which prevents Cuba from getting financing. But it's a worldwide problem. And But the struggle is going on. You know, the other side is fighting back uh, like uh, we are in all of those other countries too. Communist Party in South Africa is really on the ball about this. Thank you, Emil. OK, 
Okay, Deb, do you, would you like to have a few last words? Sure, comment? thank you. Um, I, I personally am hoping that Kamala Harris wins because that means Trump loses. Um, but regardless of who wins or loses, uh, Democrat or Republican in, a, in office, we need to organize and mobilize and fight back. And law is an important adjunct to any people's movement, but justice is not found in the courts. It is found in the streets. So remember to organize and mobilize. Thank you, thank you Deb. Alvaro? Uh, thank you, Sarah. Uh, I think that we there's a whiff of fascism in the air and it's, it's a lot at stake in the upcoming elections. So let's get out there and ensure that we've fight this hate camp, racist campaign, because it's in everybody's interest, especially the working class in this country. So let's do everything that we can to ensure that this uh, fascist trend is stopped in, in November so that we have an opportunity to seek comprehensive immigration reform, stop the racism, the, the xenophobia, which is a, a form of nationalism that is not in our interest. That's it. Thank you, Alvaro. All right, well, I think we are going to wrap it up now. Thank you to all of our panelists and thank you to our interpreters, David and Mari, and thank you to our tech master, Rosanna. Thank you to all of you. Thank you to everyone that attended and thank you for your comments and questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to every single one, but Great discussion. Thank you very much. Thank Have you, Sarah day. and Rosanna and all the panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, all. Good night. Bye. Bye. Thank you.